All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for joining us today for the Research at Home webinar with Dr. Michael Bickerstaff. Um, Michael will be presenting for 30 to 45, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll handle a Q&A session at the end. You can submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. The chat feature does not work in the webinar um, platform. We'll also give you the opportunity to raise your hand, to ask your question um, out loud if you want when the Q&A session starts. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to um, Dr. Janet Ward. Hello everybody and welcome to the uh, approximately 10th month now of our Research at Home webinar series hosted by the Office of the Vice President for Research and Partnerships here at the University of Oklahoma. My name is Janet Ward. I'm a Senior Associate Vice President for Research and Partnerships, and it's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Michael Biggerstaff. The title of Dr. Biggerstaff's talk is Looking Through the Eye of Landfalling Hurricanes, an Observational Perspective. Dr. Michael Biggerstaff is Professor of Meteorology in the College of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences at OU. And let me give you just a couple of uh, descriptive phrases about his achievements. They're pretty astonishing. In 1997, Dr. Biggerstaff started a collaboration to develop mobile weather radars, leading to the shared mobile atmospheric research and teaching, aka SMART radar program, which is now managed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Cooperative Institute for Mesoscale Meteorological Studies here at OU. Dr. Biggerstaff has led more than 30 federally sponsored field campaigns using this smart radar technique to study extreme weather. He has collected data in 14 hurricanes so far. His research accolades are many, including, for example, serving as co-chair of the Digital Hurricane Consortium. Please join me today in welcoming Dr. Michael Biggerstaff. Over to you, Michael. Thank you very much for that introduction. What I'm going to do now is uh, go ahead and share the screen so we can actually see the presentation. All right, so there's the title slide and sort of eye candy to kind of get you thinking about uh, what we're going to be talking about is hurricanes, of course, and uh, from an observational perspective. Before we get too far into the talk, I want to take a moment and just thank some of the people who've contributed to the information I'll be sharing with you today, particularly Addison Alford is a PhD student of mine doing his dissertation research on hurricane dynamics. Also, Mr. Gordon Carey, who's been working for me for more than 20 years as a research scientist. Uh, he's my right hand, my right arm, and my right leg when we're out in the field. And then uh, toward the bottom of that list is Dr. Sean Wall from the National Severe Storms Lab. Uh, he and I are, are co-authors on a grant uh, from the National Institute of Standards and Technology that allowed us to go out in the field the last couple of years to uh, collect data on some of the more recent hurricanes. As always, the comments are my own and do not reflect any official policy of any federal or state government agency. In order to really appreciate what we have available to study hurricanes today, I want to take you back through and, and sort of go over some of the very early periods of what was available and how people were able to, to understand that hurricanes existed and what they were uh, capable of doing and the structure of hurricanes. And really 1935 is, is a landmark year for, for the reason that that was the first time that an airplane actually was used to, to hunt a hurricane. And we'll talk about that here in a couple of minutes. But prior to 1935, really the only thing we had were ship reports. So there were ships that would cross the Atlantic. There were ships that would go from the mainland down to the Caribbean islands and back. And whenever these ships would run into a hurricane, if they made it back to port, they would say, hey, there's a storm out there. It may make landfall here. And so there would be a lot of activity to try to prepare people. But the lead time was really, really small. And, and so there wasn't often enough lead time to really warn the public. And, and, uh, and it often led to devastation like that that occurred in 1900 in, in, the, in the town of Galveston, Texas. And in that year, a hurricane made landfall and it inundated the, the Galveston area with eight to 15 feet of water. 8,000 people lost their lives. Most of the city was destroyed. And it really changed the economic coastline of Texas because at that time, Galveston was the main port in that area. But after this hurricane pretty much destroyed that city, the port moved to the Houston area. And of course, now we can see just how big Houston has grown because of that. Also in 1935 was, was a, a particular event called the 
Labor Day hurricane. And this hurricane is still one of the strongest hurricanes to ever make landfall in the United States. And this is an interesting weather chart that is shown down here on the bottom left. These are lines of constant pressure that was put together by the United States Weather Bureau at the time, the forerunner to the National Weather Service. And if you look, there's these little circles over land and, and at those locations, they can measure the pressure. But all these contours of pressure that are indicating where the hurricane is, is there's no data to support that. There, there were no reports to support that. But yet the, the analysts drew that in based on what happened the day before when it made landfall in the Florida Keys where they were able to measure the pressure and they kind of just assumed, hey, there's still a really strong hurricane off of Tampa out here and we, we need to show that in our, in our weather charts. Now, if a student were to draw all these contours without data, uh, we, we'd give them a really bad grade. But in that era, that's all you could do. You, you had some report from the day or two before and so you kind of knew that structure existed and you did your best to, to figure out where it was based on the what little data you had at the time. Now, before we get to the airplanes, another invention came along right at the, the 1930s, and that was the first radio sonde. So prior to that, people would use kites to take measurements of temperature and humidity in the atmosphere, but the kites couldn't go very far. And people would sometimes get in balloons and go up and down taking measurements as well. But again, you really couldn't go very far up because of the lack of oxygen. But in 1929, Robert Biro in France invented the first radio transmitter attached to a weather instrument that he then hung a balloon on and, and floated and up into the atmosphere. So that actually now gave us profiles of things like temperature, humidity, the pressure. And if you could track the balloon using the kind of a telescope-like uh, instrument, you could actually look at the location of the balloon with time and then figure out what the winds were between those two uh, measurements of, of the balloon location. So we could actually track the balloons and, and get winds at least until they went into the clouds. Um, nowadays, there's 92 of these radio sign stations around the United States. And the instrument package fortunately has shrunk a lot. Uh, it's a very nice uh, small package of instruments now. And these balloons go up to 100,000 feet or so uh, before they burst. Now we have 92 of these operational stations in the United States, but there's actually a lot of mobile instrumentation as well. And I wanna show an example of a mobile weather balloon launch in a hurricane. So this is Hurricane Irma in 2017 in Florida. And we're just a, a little bit off of uh, Fort Lauderdale uh, along the interstate there. And, and uh, the, the weather radar truck is actually where the video is being shot from. Uh, what you're seeing there is the National Severe Storms Lab mobile mesonet that also has helium tanks in it. And it's been used to, to, to fill a weather balloon. So the person that you're seeing outside the balloon, that's Addison Alford, my PhD student. And then there's actually another person that's also there, but you don't see him until the very end. So I'm just going to go ahead and run this little video, kind of show you what it was like. And you see that the winds are really, really strong. Uh, and, and you have to hold that balloon down. So it's best to inflate it inside this canvas bag. And, and you actually have to have someone inside the bag holding the whole thing down to the ground or else it will get away from you very quickly. Now, Addison's already tied the instrument on. He's going to the truck to make sure that the receiver inside the truck is, is collecting the data. And then he's going back. And then he's gonna check down the road here, make sure there's no oncoming traffic. Of course, it's a hurricane. There really wasn't a lot of traffic. And then he's gonna pull the ripcord and release the weather balloon. As he does, you'll, you'll see Sean Wall let go of it. So Sean Wall is like six foot three and he's inside this little bag where we're inflating the weather balloon and attaching the radio sign. And that's really the only way you can do it in a hurricane environment. But we are successfully launching weather balloons even in hurricanes. Now I wanna go back to 1935 because in 1935, that was the sit year where things changed, right? Before that, we had ship reports, we had over land, some of these, these early weather balloons were occurring around 1930 and so forth. But in 1935, ships were coming into Cuba and they were reporting that they had passed through a hurricane to get there and that they were afraid the hurricane was gonna make landfall soon. Now the Cuban army said, you know, we need to find out where that hurricane is and, what, and if it's really gonna make landfall. And so the Cuban army fl uh, flew a plane out to go look for that hurricane. And that was the first Hurricane Hunter flight. 
It was actually conducted by American uh, expatriate Captain Leonard Hobie of the Cuban army. And, and he flew a Curtis Hawk biplane. And that's in the upper left image there. That's, that's an image of the plane that he used on the first Hurricane Hunter flight. And you can see it's an open cockpit aircraft. So there's no way you're flying into a hurricane in an open cockpit plane. Uh, and he didn't do it either. He flew around the edges of the rain bands and basically said, okay, based on the structure of the rain bands and everything, I, I kind of think that the hurricane is, is where this red triangle is on the map on the lower left. And, and so if you look at that map on the lower left, you'll see that red diamond shape. And that was the location that he pinpointed where the hurricane was. The blue diamond or black diamond further to the south is actually the analysis from the United States Weather Bureau at that time. And so this was really showing the utility of using aircraft to go out and actually find hurricanes. And this was the very first time it was done. Now, this of course made news and it was well uh, published in, in the papers in the United States. And eventually Congress passed a bill to use aircraft and Coast Guard cutters to go out and search for hurricanes, but nothing really came of that. Uh, there was really no, uh, no flights that took place from the United States and uh, hurricane, uh, the Coast Guard cutters were never used uh, to go out and, and search for the hurricanes either. But in 1943, another event took place. There was news that a hurricane was making landfall in Houston, Texas. And there was actually a training facility for British uh, and American fighters, uh, fighter pilots uh, during World War II in the Bryan, Texas area. Now Bryan, Texas is a sister city to College Station. They're joined at the hip. College Station is where Texas A&M University is. It's not really along the coast, it's further inland, but the base commander thought, well, if there's a hurricane making landfall in Houston, it's a chance that it could come up here, could damage the planes. And so he ordered that the planes be flown further inland. And the British pilots that were receiving the training at the time kind of laughed and said, oh, these planes are so fragile. They, they, they can't survive a little wind and a little rain. Uh, well, the, the flight instructor took issue with, with uh, how the British pilots were kind of behaving. And so he bet them that he could take his plane, an AT-6 Texan trainer, which is a pictured on the upper right. It's a two, two uh, person uh, closed cockpit, single engine propeller driven plane and fly into the hurricane and come back. So on a bet and without permission from the base commander, he took off with his co-pilot uh, co and flew into the hurricane as it was making landfall in Houston. They mapped out the, the size of the eye they came back, they reported their findings, and it excited the weather officer at the base so much that he talked Colonel Duckworth into doing it again. So he actually made two flights into a landfalling hurricane. And since this is an unpressurized aircraft, they, they went in at, at 4,000 feet altitude, which is really too close to the surface to do that kind of work. It's, it's very dangerous. We don't do these things uh, anymore at all. And it, and it was amazing that he didn't run into uh, a circulation that could have downed the aircraft. So uh, fortunately, uh, that, that didn't happen. And it actually proved that you could use planes to, to find hurricanes. So the Army, the US Army, formed the Hurricane Recon Squad in 1944. And they were using bombers that were available uh, from the war effort for doing that. Uh, but there wasn't routine initially. It wasn't routine missions until 1946, 1947. And then there was a gap and then they picked it back up again in 51 through 54. Around 1955, the B-29s were having to be retired because of corrosion um, and fatigue on the metal airframe. And so B-50s uh, were, were available at that time to be used for weather recon. They were a variant of the B-29, so they looked similar to that. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't as great an aircraft, uh, or at least um, there were maybe stronger storms during this period, but over, over that decade of the 1950s, uh, there were 13 accidents that, that resulted in 66 uh, crew members of the Hurricane Recon Squad losing their lives. Uh, so a very unfortunate period of time. Now the flights that they took uh, are, are mapped out here on the lower left, and you can actually see that they flew out of Florida and they also flew out of Puerto Rico. And, and these are the regions, the, the, the black, the orange were the flights out of uh, Florida, the blue and the green were taken out of uh, Puerto Rico. And you can see exactly where they were mapping out what the weather was like. So they would routinely fly these, these locations and search for hurricanes or report weather conditions in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico and, and part of the Western Atlantic. 
Um, it was a fairly limited area, but that was all we had in the 1950s and early 1960s. So what did the weather reports look like in those days? Well, remember, these, these are aircraft that didn't have inertial navigation units in them. And so in order to track the plane, they, they, or, or in order to determine the wind speed, they had to know the position of the plane. And the plane would be blown around by the winds itself. And so there was kind of this feedback error on you needed to know the winds to know exactly where the plane was, but you needed to use the plane location to know where the winds, what the winds were like. And so the data weren't particularly reliable, uh, but it was the best that we had. And so a weather officer would be on board and every 15 minutes, he would plot the location uh, of, of the aircraft and uh, what the wind speeds were, whether there was turbulence, whether there was heavy rain, uh, what the temperature was like and things like that. So we had this data every 15 minutes and that's what it looked like. And it was hand plotted and then uh, it would be brought back to base or, or maybe uh, somewhat encoded and, and transmitted via radio. But, but really this, this wasn't very timely information. Now this particular flight, they believe they actually passed the, the center of circulation on this tropical storm that was uh, observed on 3rd of September, 1948. It was one of the first times they actually flew into the center of the circulation. Now, in addition to these weather reports, the, the pilots would also look out of the cockpit and look at the sea state. Uh, and they did that because of a British uh, admiral who published a, uh, a, a guide for interpreting the wind speeds at the surface based on the wave activity. And this is the Beaufort scale. It was published in 1805. It's still in use today. Uh, this sea state is actually uh, after the passage of Hurricane Dorian, uh, this was taken off of a, a U.S. Coast Guard aircraft that was used in the relief effort uh, after Dorian made landfall in, in the Caribbean. So today, we have a lot better aircraft and a lot better instrumentation on board the aircraft. Uh, in the 1950s, we had the B-50 aircraft. Uh, those were retired C-130s, the cargo planes, the four-engine turboprop aircraft became available in the 1960s. Uh, variants of that uh, C-130 is still being used today in the, the official hurricane hunters from the U.S. Air Force. In the 1970s, the, the P-3 aircraft were developed, and the P-3 aircraft are what NOAA uses uh, for their hurricane missions. It's, it's, a, it's a lot more scientific payload on the NOAA P-3s than there are on the Air Force C-130s, uh, but they have slightly different missions. And then we also got the Gulf Stream, which is a jet aircraft, can fly at very high altitude, and it launches radio signs out of the Gulf Stream. Now, of course, these aren't attached to weather balloons. They're actually a tube device that has the radio sign package in it, and there's a parachute that once it's, it leaves the plane, the parachute opens, and the thing drifts down to the surface. So we fly at very high altitudes and launch these things called drop signs rather than radio signs um, or up signs. Uh, but it's still radio sound, it's just going down instead of up. In addition to these operational aircraft that are used for hunting hurricanes and measuring the, the atmospheric state and the ocean state around the hurricane, uh, NASA has a variety of aircraft that they occasionally use for hurricane missions. They do a lot of different studies, uh, but they occasionally do hurricane flights as well. That includes the NASA U-2 aircraft uh, or modified U-2 called the ER-2 airplane. That can fly at least 50,000 feet in, in, the, in the sky. I think that's the declassified altitude, although the plane's been around forever and everybody knows it can exceed 50,000 feet. The NASA Global Hawk uh, is a, another aircraft that became available in 2010. It has some um, radar uh, platforms on it as well, which I'll show some data from here at, toward the end of the, of the talk today. And it's also able to send out these uh, drops on packages. So what does data look like, right? So I'm going to show you the radar data because I, I think it's really interesting. Uh, the animation here on the upper left is actually from the lower fuselage radar on the NOAA P-3 aircraft as it's flying around and into Hurricane Harvey off the coast of Texas in 2017. And you can see it's making a pass through the eyewall there and another one there. And then it turns and comes back and goes back again. It goes back again and again and again and again. And then finally they say, oh, you know, we're getting low on fuel and we got to get back to our base. And that's that. So I don't know that animation is very, very fast, but it actually shows you the structure that came from this, this radar that's on the bottom of the, of the fuselage of the, of the plane. Uh, the structure is better than you can see with satellite data. It's really, there's really nothing like putting a radar on a plane and being able to map that out. And in addition to the lower fuselage radar, there's a radar on the tail of the aircraft 
that's a Doppler radar, and it allows us to measure the winds beyond the flight path of the plane. So we're not just taking the winds along the flight uh, path, but we're actually looking now at the winds around the airplane from this Doppler radar. And we can then do things like uh, what you see in the upper right, which is a, a map of the radar echo and color, and then the, the uh, wind barbs showing you the, the wind speed and the wind direction around the hurricane. You see the counterclockwise circulation uh, and then the increasing wind speeds as we get close to the center of the circulation there. In addition to, to aircraft, uh, weather buoys were also becoming available around the time of, of World War II. And in fact, the German Navy were the first ones to deploy weather buoy, buoys uh, from U-boats. Uh, and these devices would measure atmospheric and oceanic temperature and pressure four times a day and then encode the data and send it back uh, through radio transmissions to the U-boats. Uh, when the battery died, the instrument was designed to self-destruct because they didn't want the uh, Allied forces to learn uh, about their weather buoy capabilities. Uh, the United States Navy deployed weather buoys after World War II, starting in 1951, and there's currently 100 weather buoys deployed around the coast of the United States. Uh, in the upper right, I'm showing you a, a graph of what the data looks like from one of these weather buoys. This is one that was um, out in, in the, uh, I think it was in the Atlantic or maybe the Gulf, Anyway, it captured the passage of Hurricane Rita on September 23rd of 2005. The red trace is actually showing the pressure. So you can see how the pressure is going down. The pressure um, uh, labels are, are on the right-hand side, the vertical axis on the right-hand side. So you can see the pressure going down into the eye of the storm and then uh, getting stronger again as, as the storm passes. The green line are the five-second maximum wind gust. So this is the maximum speed of the winds uh, averaged over a five second period of time. And you see the winds got up over 60 meters per second, which is really, really strong. And then the blue line is the 10 minute average wind speed, which is uh, the, the United States uses a one minute average wind speed to classify the strength of hurricanes, but the rest of the world uses a 10 minute average. And you see the difference between that and the gust. Uh, that 10 minute average and if you put the gust on top of that, uh, the speed of the gust relative to the 10 minute average wind speed is what we call the gust factor. And uh, I'll talk about gust factors a little later on. In addition to, uh, to buoys, other things that also became available after uh, World War II was radars. Of course, radars were developed in a kind of a super secret effort. Uh, there were very crude radars that existed prior to World War II, but they were really crude. They were very unstable, very low power, they were used mainly to look at, at ships going in and out of port, uh, but they just weren't very reliable. Well, the British developed one of the first uh, stable high power transmitters used to be able to send the energy out from the radar and, and be able to bounce it off of aircraft and things. They designed it, they, they brought it over to the United States because they knew that their industry was gonna likely be gonna be bombed. They wouldn't be able to mass produce these radars and, they, and we really needed a lot of them for the war effort. And so they provided that uh, technology to the United States and we mass produce the radars. So in terms of weather tracking and hurricane tracking, the first radars that were available were these old military radars. So an example of this is uh, shown in the upper left. This is the Air Defense Command FPS-6 radar that was uh, available after, after the war. And one of those was actually deployed uh, off of, of Massachusetts. And it captured some of the first images of hurricanes that were passing through the East Coast at that time. Uh, Hurricane Edna was the first one that was tracked in 1954. The one I'm showing here is Ione in, in 1955. You can see the outer rain bands. So look at that structure. I mean, that's, that's what you had in the 1950s was this phosphorescent uh, display that, that would, you know, the, the brightness of the white was kind of an example of the intensity of the echo and, and that's all you had. And you'd, you'd actually put a camera attached to the screen and take a snapshot and then develop the film in order to record the information. So this is actually a, a slide from a film that was attached to the screen in order to capture that structure, which is a, well, it was really hard to, to be able to use quantitatively, but that was the, some of the early weather radar time that, that we have. Nowadays, of course, we have very sophisticated, modernized uh, weather service radars. These are the uh, weather surveillance radars, 1988 Dopplers. Uh, you can see the, the, the antenna reflector on the upper left image there. That's a 28-foot diameter dish. It's, it's a huge dish, and it's underneath this radome 
because you can imagine what the wind load would be on that dish. You would have to have incredible gears uh, and, and motors to drive that if you let it be exposed to the wind. So instead they put this cover over the whole thing uh, called a ray dome. It looks like a big giant golf ball. You've probably seen them around uh, Norman, Oklahoma and other places. Uh, but this is what it looks like inside of one of those. And I'm showing data in the center panel here. This is the last image taken from the Weather Service radar in Lake Charles uh, as Hurricane Laura made landfall earlier this year. And of course, we all know what happened to that radar. It was destroyed by, by the hurricane winds. And the picture on the right shows the remnants of uh, what the, the radar looked like after Laura went through. Um, Currently, the National Weather Service has 155 of these radars, and they're operated by the Weather Service Department of Defense and the FAA. Uh, research is, is underway at Oklahoma and the National Severe Storms Lab and other places to eventually replace these mechanically turning dish with phased array systems that will be able to sample the atmosphere in, in under a minute. Right now, it takes five to six minutes to collect a volume of data, and in the future, we'll be able to do that in less than a minute. So going back uh, again, sort of uh, the war effort and things that came out of, of World War II that was used for studying hurricanes included rocket technology. And so this is the forerunner to satellites. And what I'm showing it in the upper left is a photograph taken from White Sands Missile Range. And that's me standing next to a rocket sonde. Uh, these, these devices are used to take measurements of the atmosphere at very high altitudes, much, much further than a weather balloon would be able to spy because the balloon, of course, expands as it goes up and it eventually bursts around 100,000 feet or so typically. Uh, but these rockets actually go much, much higher than that. And uh, they're able to measure the temperature and humidity and winds at the, at the upper regions of the atmosphere. Now in the 1950s, they were shooting a lot of these rockets around off of uh, White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. And they put 16 millimeter cameras on the rockets to study the flight dynamics. Uh, but they also captured stunning images of clouds, which led to the de de development of first weather satellite uh, that used infrared imagery rather than the visible so we could actually see the clouds at nighttime. And the first hurricane that was actually discovered, now remember the airplanes are flying around looking for hurricanes, but the first one that was actually discovered not by airplanes, but by satellite was Esther in 1961 by the Tyros-3 satellite. Of course, nowadays we have very sophisticated satellites looking at a whole bunch of different channels of microwave energy uh, that give us the storm structure. This is an animation of the rapid scan energy available from GO-16 of Hurricane Zeta as it made landfall just a few days ago in Louisiana. You see the incredible structure that's available, very fast uh, and, uh, time scanning of the satellite. So we're getting really incredible data now from the satellites that we, that we didn't have before. Uh, we also have, of course, uh, orbiting uh, uh, satellites, uh, including the Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission satellite that put the first radar, weather radar in space, and it captured uh, the rain bands and the eye wall of Hurricane Bonnie uh, back in 1998. And so there's, there's a variety of these types of instruments. Some of them are geostationary and, and allow us to look at the scene continuously at time. Some of them orbit the planet, and so we get these, uh, these occasional looks at, at the clouds as it orbits. So kind of recapping the post or the pre-modern era, right? So this is all before really what we, what we get at today. There were ship reports in the 1900s for short lead time. We eventually got radio signs, but these were mainly over land. We really didn't have time to, to look around. Uh, aircraft, aircraft hunter flights were started in 1935, but really didn't, after that one, there really wasn't any indication there was any others until 1946. Buoys became available in the 1940s. Uh, rocket sondes and radars were around in the 1950s, in the mid-1950s. And finally, by uh, 1960, we had radar satellites, or we had satellites that were able to take imagery. So today, there's a wide variety of instrumentation. I've shown you some of the more modern aircraft, sort of the more modern radio sond capability and other things, the satellite imagery. And a lot of what we know is from, about hurricanes has come from those operational measurements. Um, but the aircraft really only work over the ocean. The satellites really only see the tops of the clouds. The Weather Service radars, they're along the coast, a lot of them, but they're kind of sparsely located and, and landfall might not be close to that radar. And so you really can't measure the storm closest to the ground where the impacts is. So in, in order to augment the operational uh, capability of the United States, there's a lot of research implementation. Now, some of this is owned by the federal agencies, but a vast majority of it is actually owned 
by universities, including University of Oklahoma. And this is just a picture of the instrumentation that was used to study tornadoes in the Great Plains during 2009 and 2010. Uh, and you can see in, in the lower left portion of that, there's these tripod things. These are weather stations on tripods called stick nets. And then in the lower right, you see these yellow circular devices. These are weather stations on pods, since they're called pods. And then back behind the people in that front row there, you can see all the instrumentation cars that are, have these weather stations mounted on them. Those are the mobile mesonets. And then behind the mobile mesonets, we actually start to see the, the weather radars. Uh, so we had radars from the University of Texas, uh, or uh, sorry, Texas Tech University. We had radars from the uh, University of uh, Massachusetts. We had radars from the University of Oklahoma, from the National Severe Storms Lab, and from the Center for Severe Weather Research. So tremendous amount of instrumentation that's available to bring out to study hurricanes, but the cost, the cost is huge. This, this experiment here costs so much that you only get to do them about every 20 years. So we can't really do hurricane research using this kind of uh, array of instrumentation. So instead, what we do is a much smaller uh, set of instrumentation. And the University of Oklahoma has been kind of a leader in this for a long period of time. We use the mobile radars, the smart radars, we use the uh, Advanced Radar Research Center rapid scanning radar as well, called RAXPOL. Down in the lower left is a picture of that uh, during Hurricane Irene. And then, of course, we had the mobile mesonet that you saw us uh, launch a weather balloon from in Irma. And then we developed some of our own pod-like, stick net-like uh, weather stations that we deploy. But they also have these distrometers on them, which allows us to measure the shape of the raindrops so we can actually improve our estimation of, of the rainfall uh, from these landfalling hurricanes. So most of what I'm going to be talking about is data collected from this. Now, in order to, to really put it in the context, there's a lot of jargon in all the sciences, and, and sometimes jargon can be uh, frustrating to, to understand. So I want to use a little bit of that, but I want to define what I mean. So in a hurricane, this is actually a photo of Hurricane Isabel, 2003. And you can see that the innermost circle is where the eye wall would be, and that's where the radius of maximum wind would likely uh, be found. If we take three times that distance of the uh, radius of the rack maximum wind, that's what we mean by the inner core. So the inner core is sort of the area outside the eye wall, but it doesn't extend as far out as, as some of the outer rain bands. So we have the outer core, the inner core, and then the eye wall region of the hurricane. And then if we look at, at the radar echo structure, this is from Willoughby's work at published 1988, uh, you can see that in the outer core region, there's a lot of these convective rain bands called the outer rain bands. And in the inner core region, there's some convective rain bands, but it's really more uh, what they called connecting bands in those days. But these are actually still uh, rain bands. And we're actually gonna look at that in more detail. Uh, we also have the eye wall. And this particular model is showing uh, the eye wall replacement cycle. So there's an outer eye wall and an inner eye wall that only occurs for really intense hurricanes and we're not gonna worry about that. But I wanna talk uh, uh, again about the conceptual model of, uh, of what a hurricane should look like. And, and this was work that was published in uh, 83 and 91 by Gary Barnes from the University of Hawaii. And they were using the NOAA P-3 aircraft and they went out and they measured Hurricane Raymond in 1983 and, and, and studied the structure of the convective region of that rain band. And so, the, the contours that you're seeing there, uh, uh, the upper portion of the diagram, the first one is the contours of radar echo or called reflectivity. And so you can kind of see the structure of the intensity of the echo. Now in color, I've shown an example from a squall line in Oklahoma. And if you look at the region between 16 and 80 kilometers and kind of compare those contours with the contours of what you see above, it's very similar, very similar structure to an Oklahoma squall line. So the, the convective region of, of a hurricane ring band looks a lot like what we see uh, in, in Oklahoma as well. And then the other part of that on, on the right is showing the, the updrafts and downdrafts. So the updrafts are contoured positive, the downdrafts are contoured dashed. Uh, in the lower panel that's color, you can see that the warm colors are updrafts, the cool colors are downdrafts. And again, you, you see patterns that are very, very typical. So a convective rain band uh, should look a lot like the structure that you see in an in, in Oklahoma squall line. They have the stair step pattern of updrafts and, and, uh, and downdrafts showing the different stages of evolution of the convection uh, within the bands. Uh, so 
Knowing that, we went out and we took measurements of rain bands. This is a Hurricane Isabel 2003. It's the first time we had both smart radars available for hurricane studies. You can see we we're capturing a lot of rain bands there. The SR1 and SR2 show you the location of the radars relative to the storm. And the black circles are the areas where we can use the data from the, both the radars to retrieve three-dimensional lens. The reason why there's a limit to, to that area is that the radars can't be looking in the same direction because we're only able to measure the component toward or away from the radar. We need two different components in order to measure the, the, uh, the wind speed and, and direction. So it's only over these, these areas in there. And you see, we're not actually capturing the entire storm. It was a very big hurricane. And so we're only capturing really a portion of the storm. But those are the rain bands that, that were passing through our domain. And we were expecting to see things very similar to, um, to what Gary Barnes had, had published. So this is a, a chart now on the left that shows that radar echo uh, with the ground relative winds that we retrieved from our radar analysis. And the, the black line at the top is, is uh, I, where I'm going to show a vertical cross section. The panel on the right just shows the, uh, the updraft and downdraft structure. Again, the updrafts are the uh, warm colors, the pinks, yellows, and red, or the pinks and reds and oranges. Downdrafts are in blue. And you can see the speeds are not very strong. They're, they're, they're similar in magnitude to what uh, was observed by Barnes et al. and others in, uh, in hurricanes. And so we thought, OK, you know, the structure looks pretty good. We've got bands. Uh, and, and we were seeing vertical velocities that are similar to what we saw in the past. And we thought that, that it was going to be a, a typical analysis until we looked at the cross section. And in the cross section, the top one here, I'm showing that red or echo return. And you see these multiple maxima that are occurring in, in that cross section. So we're seeing these multiple rain bands. Well, that's not very surprising. But if we look at the next panel down, the middle one, uh, that's showing blues and, and, and browns and reds, that's the updrafts and downdrafts. The downdrafts are blue, the updrafts are, are orange and reds. And that, those are very deep. They're, they're nothing like what we saw in, in Barnes's work from Hurricane Raymond or the Oklahoma Squall Line. Uh, these are very deep uh, circulations. And uh, you know, the first time the student brought me this, this analysis, Renee Curry, uh, I told her, oh, it must be wrong. You know, please do it again. And uh, she did, and it turned out to be right. And, uh, and, and at first, I was befuddled because I was thinking, wow, that's, uh, that's not to be expected. But there was actually work that had already been published. I just wasn't aware of it because you can't read every paper that comes out in atmospheric science. There's so many. But there was work that actually uh, showed numerical simulation of a hurricane. Uh, and the hurricane was producing something called vortex Rossby waves, or VRWs. Vortex Rossby waves uh, are generated from perturbations in the eye wall. I'll show you that a little bit later on. But the, the, the white, uh, the grayscale colored uh, figure down in the bottom um, right portion of the slide, uh, the one that says WN-1 vertical motion, that shows you that deep structure of the updrafts and downdrafts uh, very similar to what we have in our analysis. And then to compare it even further, we, we also looked at this quantity called vorticity. Vorticity is one of these jargon words in meteorology. It's very, very uh, useful quantity. It's a measure of how fast the air wants to spin about a vertical ax uh, axis. So it's a local measurement of the rotation of the air about a vertical axis. Now, a hurricane, of course, has is, is, is got a broad scale circulation that's counterclockwise. Uh, and that would be positive vorticity. But embedded within that broad circulation are small perturbations that are wanting to turn the air in the other direction and sometimes produce negative vorticity. So those would show up in blue and then the, the areas where there's even perturbations that, that have even stronger tendency to rotate counterclockwise would be positive. So this, this vorticity field helps us identify features within the flow that are perturbations on the larger scale circulation. And, the structure of those perturbations compared to the structure of the numerical simulation really bore out that these, these were rain bands and vertical velocities and, uh, that were associated with these vortex Rossby waves. Now, we were also worried that maybe we were looking at the, the, the conceptual model uh, outside. Uh, you know, we, we were comparing rain bands on the outside to, to the inner core structure. And so we looked at the conceptual model of the hurricanes from the inner core. And again, they have this big mesoscale updraft and mesoscale downdraft. It's the same structure you see in mid-latitude squall lines. Uh, so there really wasn't any evidence for these rain bands uh, that were generated by these, these uh, 
vortex velocity waves. Now, I've said that vortex velocity waves are generated by perturbations in the eye wall. Of course, as the hurricane is making landfall, it's feeling the effects of, of the land, and that disrupts the circulation, the primary circulation of the hurricane. It produces these perturbations. There's an example of this on the upper left chart that shows perturbations in the eye wall of Hurricane Harvey as it's making landfall. And those perturbations are actually causing regions of vorticity to become enhanced right along the edges of the eye wall. And those enhanced regions of vorticity are what we're going to call mesovortices. And these mesovortices are actually really important to uh, understanding the damage that occurs from, from, from land falling hurricanes. But the other aspect of, of vortex velocity waves is that they generate these, these inward moving waves that help produce mesovortices along the inner edge of the eye wall. But they also produce an outward propagating wave that creates these narrow rain bands that we observed in the inner core. And so here's an example of that taken from Harvey again uh, at two different times, only seven minutes apart. And the, and the black regions that are uh, circled in there, the, the, the ones on the left are that radar echo uh, or radar reflectivity. And you can see the rain bands separating from the eye wall with time. And that's an outward propagating uh, Rossby wave. And we know this because we're looking at the vorticity of it as well. And you can see that sort of in the other panel uh, being circled, showing the region of positive vorticity also being affected uh, outward by the radial winds within the hurricane. So vortex Rossby waves explain both the narrow rain bands that we saw in uh, Isabel and Harvey and really all the other land falling storms we've been in. And they also explain the development of those vortices along the inner edge of the eye wall. Now, uh, we, we see this at landfall a lot, but we don't really see it over the open ocean. And so one of the things we've been trying to do is, is find very high resolution data available to look for these uh, rain bands in the inner core of hurricanes over the open ocean. And uh, Addison Alford, my PhD student, just recently uh, provided this, this analysis, uh, high altitude imaging wind and airborne radar profile or high wrap data that was collected uh, during Hurricane Matthew by the NASA Globe Hawk. So that was that uh, unmanned drone that very, flies at very high altitude that also drops uh, radio signs out of the, uh, the plane, but it also has this radar on it. And we're able to look at the radar echo structure now it attenuates so you don't see the heaviest rain portion uh, in, in the eye wall. So there's a, there's a gap there that we can't see the bottom of the eye wall because the attenuation of the radar energy that they use. But you can see to, to the right of that in the top panel, you can see these uh, red dash circles and those are indications of where the rainy bands are. And then looking at the vorticity structure, again, to kind of compare it to the theory and to some of the mining work, and you can see that we have these, these patterns of positive and negative regions with local circulation, uh, perturbations on the larger scale flow that are very, very similar to what the theory would predict and, and what the numerical model shows. So we do see, uh, these vortex Rossby wave driven rain bands, even over the open ocean. Now, in, in addition to uh, the basic research that we do, we also do a lot of applied research and I'm gonna have to kind of quickly go through this, but uh, this is showing some of the uh, data that we collected in Hurricane Harvey, where we took the analysis of data every five minutes and we looked at the maximum wind that occurred at each grid point in our analysis domain. And then we used that and we projected it down to the surface and so we made a map of the maximum winds that were observed during the landfall of Harvey. And based on that, we, we found that Harvey was really a category three storm instead of a category four storm. We sent that evidence to the National Hurricane Center. We were invited, we went out and gave a talk. We worked with them for a couple of days and they have uh, said that they will eventually correct their record. It takes a little bit of time for them to, to actually officially correct their record. But, Right now, everybody thinks Harvey was a category four storm at landfall. It actually turned out to be a category three storm at landfall. And it still produced a tremendous amount of damage, but we have to understand the importance of that damage being associated with a category three instead of a category four. Because you know, people really think that a category four is something you should evacuate from. Category three, maybe they don't have to. But if you looked at the damage that occurred, uh, from this category three storm, you really should evacuate anytime a major hurricane is gonna make landfall. Now, in addition to the maximum wind, we also looked at the durations for extreme winds uh, that occurred and we were able to map that out for the first time uh, using our, our radar data. And they were also able to look at the characteristics of 
of the structure of the storm that is producing these maximum winds. And this is an interesting slide because it, it shows you the, the vorticity field again. And these bright red spots are where we got these mesovortices and the, they occur right along the edges of gradients and the radar echo. So they're right on the inner edge of the eye wall that are contributing to these maximum winds. These mesovortices can have gust two to three times the average 10 minute wind, 10 minute wind uh, speed. In a hurricane, typically you only see gusts that are 30% more than the average wind. But in these mesovortices, you're talking about 200 to 300% more than the, than the average wind speed, which is tremendous. And they can produce a lot of damage. Here's a slide of, of damage we think that came from one of these mesovortices that occurred in Rockport during the landfall of Harvey. Now, this slide is showing some of the maximum winds that we collected this year, including uh, Laura on the upper left. And I sort of highlighted these regions where the wind speeds were greater than 170 miles an hour, just 250 meters above the surface. One of those regions is actually approaching the Lake Charles radar. And this is right before the radar was destroyed. So it's very likely that one of these regions of very strong background winds with an embedded mesovortex hit the radar. The wind gust was probably close to 200% of the background flow and it just destroyed, destroyed that, that radar system. I mean, it wasn't the average wind speed that did it. It was, it was an incredible gust, likely not a tornado, but likely one of these mesovortices. Uh, in addition to doing basic research and applied research, we also do uh, sometimes operational support. And so, of course, after Laura destroyed the Weather Service radar, it turns out that another hurricane wanted to make landfall in, in essentially the same area. And so we took one of the smart radars and we deployed Lake Charles to provide operational support for the local National Weather Service office. And CNN was kind enough to put out a report showing uh, that uh, occurred. And so it, it's great for the university to be recognized as providing uh, support to the uh, to, to the nation. I mean, we, we do a lot of research. We do a lot of education, teaching and things like that. Students go out in the field with me uh, to collect the data in these hurricanes. But this is an example where we actually use the, the capability of the university to provide weather support for the general public. And uh, we hope to be able to do that even more in the future. So a quick summary here. We have observational capability for hurricanes that have grown rapidly over the decades. Uh, we often augment the operational uh, research uh, capabilities with our university on research. OU and the National Severe Storms Lab is employed in 15 radars uh, to study the inland flooding and extreme winds associated with hurricanes. We found evidence of these things called vortex velocity waves, which really weren't observed very well in the past. So that's kind of a contribution that we made. And we also documented for the first time uh, at high resolution over large areas, the maximum winds duration and uh, extreme winds in landfall and hurricanes so we can better understand the damage to homes and businesses and contribute to the development of, of new building codes. And we recently provided operational support during the landfall of Hurricane Delta. And with that, I'll stop and see if there's any questions. Thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, you can submit those via the Q&A box at the bottom, or you can raise your hand and we can call on you. Just give it another minute or two just in case people are typing up their questions right now. While they're typing up questions, I just want to uh, point out that the University of Oklahoma is part of this thing called the Digital Hurricane Consortium, which is a group of universities that actually bring instrumentation out in advance of landfalling hurricanes. 
Uh, we, we do it in a variety of different funding agencies. So there, there isn't a real well-coordinated uh, sponsor for that activity. But as scientists, we've all decided that it's better to share our information and work together. So we actually have been collaborating a lot the last few years. And Hurricane Harvey was, was an example where we had uh, our radars, we had radars from the national, uh, from the from the uh, Center for Severe Weather Research. We had stick nets from Texas Tech University, and we had towers from the University of Florida all out there at the same time. And we actually worked to coordinate the deployment of that during the, the landfall so we could actually get a really nice integrated data set. And we've been doing that for the last few years, in, including people from uh, University of Alabama, Huntsville, and uh, Let's see, Notre Dame University is also involved. So we've got a lot of partners that bring out instrumentation to study landfalling hurricanes. And uh, we hope that we can actually continue to do that uh, in the future. It's, it's, it's really a challenge to get, the infra, to get the money available to do it because there can be years where there's no landfall. So if you write a proposal and send it to a federal agency, they never know if there's gonna be a hurricane making landfall or not. <laughs> so uh, we actually have to, to uh, find a way to convince them that it's uh, within everybody's best interest to pro provide some sort of basic support so we can fill these instruments and, and improve our understanding of hurricanes so we can better predict the inland floods and the extreme winds that are producing all the damage and the loss of life in the United States. So that, that's our mission, that's our goal. And it's uh, nice to see that a lot of university partners getting together and, and sharing their information in ways that uh, we just didn't do in, in the past. I haven't seen any questions come through. So I guess um, you covered everything that they uh, were curious about. Thank you so much for um, presenting for us today, Dr. Biggerstaff. My pleasure, thank you very much. All right, we'll sign off. Thank you everybody.